Hello, today we are talking about folding cameras, vintage folding cameras from the 1930s. And I'm gonna go through this some of my collection of vintage folding cameras, and I'm gonna talk to you about what I like about different cameras, how I use the different cameras, things that you should look for if you wanna get into folding vintage cameras. But first, if you have not subscribed to this channel, please subscribe. And if you can support us on Patreon, that's awesome. Let's get back to it. So why folding cameras? Well, I love that a folding camera gives me the ability of a really big negative in a tiny, tiny package. So for instance, this is a 1936 VESA uh, Boitlander RF, just absolutely one of my favorite cameras. And when the camera folds up to its travel position, it's very, very tiny. It's very compact, all metal construction. So I've got in my pocket the camera that has the ability of producing huge six by nine centimeter negatives and yet it travels so easily. That's one of my favorite parts about uh, folding cameras is that I just get such a big piece of film in such a small package. One of the other things that I love is that these cameras are not terribly expensive. If you wanted to get into like medium format and you were gonna buy a Hasselblad system or some advanced Rolly system or a Mamiya 7 system, you're gonna spend thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars. And those were all very, very, very fine systems. No camera on this table costs more than $650. And most of them cost right around 500, and some of them as little as three, three and a quarter. So this is a very affordable way to get into 120. But there are some things that you should know. Uh, so first, if you wanna get into 120 cameras, folding cameras, you wanna buy from a reputable source. You want to make sure that the camera has been properly serviced, that the shutter's been tuned, that the bellows don't have light leaks in it, that the film plane and the lens plane are parallel and that they're not bent, and that the focusing system, the range finder, if it has a coupled range finder, has been recalibrated. These are all things that any good camera technician who sells these type of cameras should do. Be very careful buying something that's just been sitting in a box. Um, or if it looks like it's been beat up, I probably wouldn't buy it. Um, these cameras need to be cared for. And a lot of them were really beat up you know, in the late 30s during World War II. So finding a good model is not difficult, but it's something you wanna spend time and do a little bit of research on. So what are my favorite cameras? Well, there's the big three. During the 1930s, there was Velta, Voigtlander, and Zeiss. Lots of other camera makers out there as well. But those three, I just think, made some of the absolute best cameras. Um, Zeiss had a massive production, Voigtlander was pretty big, Velta was probably the smallest of those three. Um, I'll go into a little bit about the differences of the cameras in a minute. Um, so it's important to get a camera that's been fully serviced. Um, it's important to understand that these cameras shoot 120 and 120 film means that it's going to be a little bit more expensive to shoot, a little bit more expensive to process, but when you get a negative that's you know five and six times larger than a 35 millimeter, I think it's worth it. Um, some of the cameras may come with what's called a reduction mask. That's what this right here is. These are very, very, very rare. Um, if you find a camera that has a reduction mask with it, buy the camera because they're, they're not easy to find. So this reduction mask here is for my BESA uh, RF. This is a six by nine centimeter camera. If I open it up, you can see just how big that negative area is. It's massive. This mask would lock into the camera and there's actually a switch that allows me to change the viewfinder so it goes from being that rectangle to more of a vertical rectangle like this to a 645. Um, and it allows me to now get 16 shots on a roll of 120. Whereas in standard 6.9 mode, I'm only getting eight shots. But once again, reduction masks are really hard to find. I've never seen one for either of my two Zeiss cameras. I've only seen it for uh, this camera, and I also have one for my Velta camera. But as I said, they're rare. Um, most of these cameras come in what's called a normal focal length. So on 35 millimeter, that's like a 50. Most of these cameras, the six by nines, come, these three here are six by nines, come with a 109 millimeter lens. And most of the cameras that are 6.45 or 6.6 come with a 75 millimeter lens, which is pretty much the normal for that focal length. Um, there's a lot of different lenses that were used in these cameras. Now Zeiss, of course, used their own lenses. Voigtlander used uh, three different lenses primarily, 
Um, the one that I chose has a Zeiss Tessar design. I'm a big Tessar design lens nut. I just love the rendering of a Tessar. Tessar lenses are really sharp in the middle. They fade off a little bit towards the edges, um, a little bit of vignetting, but I just love the way they feel. And cameras like the Velta uh, came with a lot of different lenses depending upon the manufacturer. This, but uh, when they were manufacturing it. This particular model from 1938 has a beautiful Zeiss Tessar uh, lens in it, an f2.8 lens, but I've also seen this exact same camera with a Schneider lens in it. Um, and all those lenses are gonna have a different feel and a different look. So this is gonna take a little bit of research on your part. You need to sort of educate yourself to different lenses from the 1930s and what the different feelings were. If you wanna just take my opinion for it, go with anything that's a Tessar design, I think you'll be happy. Um, it, 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 to me, is that best bridge between classic look and modern glass. I just love the look of a Tessar. Um, let's talk about these four different cameras here specifically today and what I like about them. Let me first talk about the Velta. Okay, so Velta cameras uh, are just gorgeous. They were made outside of Dresden. Um, they didn't really continue uh, production of the Velta Vatour after World War II because of supply issues. But these cameras are die cast. When you hold a Velta Vatour camera, it's just like a tank. Um, and when you press the release button here on the bottom, the lens just pops out beautifully. Its focusing mechanism is here on the front. Very smooth, very easy. And again, this camera takes 645 or 66 if you have the internal mask. And the front of the camera even has a mask to change the viewfinder between 66 and 645. Just super well thought out. This camera would have been used primarily by wealthy individuals, a very serious amateur photographers. The only disadvantage to the Velta is because they were a smaller production, the prism on the inside that uh, is used for the rangefinder, they're not really available anymore. So you wanna make sure if you're getting a Velta that you get it from someone who can look at that and make sure it's in good shape. Because if it's been damaged, there are no repair parts for that. You're gonna to have to end up getting another camera as a donor and then having a technician fix that. But by and large, Veltas really have, have held up quite well, but they're a very rare camera. You'll see 10 of these Zeiss cameras for one Velta. Veltas, if you look on eBay, there's just not a lot. Um, this once again is a six uh, by six and six by 4.5 aspect ratio camera, so it can shoot both different uh, negative sizes. They also made a six nine version of this camera that I'm kind of really wanting to get my hands on. Um, I've yet to find one, but I really would love to get a 6.9 Velta. Um, so one thing that's unique about the Velta, and it's different than the Zeiss, but the same as the Voigtlander, is the way the lens focuses. And this gets a little bit to a Tessar lens design. Tessar lens design, it's possible to focus using just the front element. So the front element moves, but not the whole front standard. Whereas on the Velta, if you take a look, you can see that whole front standard is moving when I focus the camera. There's a lot of people who have different opinions on this. There are some people who feel that front standard focus, which these two cameras here have, is better. That it's gonna give you a sharper image, it focuses closer, these two cameras focus down to one meter, whereas these two cameras here, which are front cell focused, only focus down to 1.5 meters. That's a big difference in distance. Um, I have done extensive tests side by side, comparing front standard focus to front cell focus. Here's my opinion. Front standard is better. There's no doubt about it. Front standard focus is better, but the only place you're gonna notice it is doing really close up work. So unless you're doing all of your work at like you know, seven feet or closer, you're really not gonna see a difference. But when you get down to that minimum focusing distance, one meter in this case, or 1.5 meters in this case, the front standard focus does have a little better resolution, a little better sharpness, and I literally, I've probably shot a dozen rolls of the same image over and over and over, just try to verify that and educate myself as to that's true, and it is. So if you're looking for close-up clarity, you wanna go with front standard. Um, if you're like most people and you're not shooting like that, seriously consider the Zeiss, it's a wonderful find. Um, another thing about the Velta that's different 
is it's one of the very first cameras from this time period that actually has the rangefinder and the viewfinder in the same window. Now Leica, when they came out with the Leica M3, which was the first Leica to combine the rangefinder and viewfinder in one window, you know, that's considered by many people to be one of the greatest 35mm, if not one of the greatest cameras ever made. But Velta was doing that back in the 1930s. Now there are advantages and disadvantages to that. The advantage of having both images in one viewfinder is obvious. When I look through the camera and I'm focusing, I'm seeing the whole image and I'm able to focus it. I'm not having to go from a focusing window and then look through a viewfinding window. I'm doing everything in the same window. So that's a big advantage. The disadvantage is the lack of magnification. If I pick up a camera like uh, my Bessa RF here by Voigtlander, you can see on the back it has two windows. One window for focus, one window for, uh, for shooting. What happens is when I look through the focus window, it's massively magnifying what I'm trying to focus on. And that means that I can be more accurate in my focus. And I've done side-by-side -side tests comparing that, and there is no doubt in my mind, especially when you're working with a negative like a six by nine, that having that enhanced magnification just makes your images that little bit more accurate, that little bit sharper. So it's not difficult at all. I look through the focus window, I set my focus, I slide my eye over, I take the picture. It's not a big deal. I've even compared, let me pull these two cameras up. I've even compared a 1936 BESA RF to a 1953-54 BESA II. So this is like the later, newer version of this camera. And I was kind of curious. This has got coated lenses. These are uncoated lenses. One note about uncoated lenses, I haven't talked about that. I'm a huge sucker for uncoated glass. I love flare. Coated, uncoated glass is crazy sharp. Anybody who says it isn't is wrong. Um, you do have to give your exposure a little bit more. If I'm working with an uncoated uh, lens camera, generally speaking, I overexpose all of my film by half to two thirds of a stop um, to compensate for that. But there's nothing about uncoated glass that I don't love. As a matter of fact, I prefer uncoated glass to coated glass almost any day of the week. So I did a test comparing the 1936 to the 1953-54 BESA. This version here, which is the newer camera, only has a single window and it is quite small and it's also quite sharp. It scratched the hell out of my glasses. Um, it's one of the problems that I have with this particular viewfinder. So this is a much lower magnification. Think about if you've ever seen a Leica M3, which is a 0.91 magnification, and you compare it to like a Leica M4, M6, or any of the digital Leicas, most of them come with a 0.72 magnification. So it's much lower. So it's much more difficult to be critical on that focus. This camera here has a much higher magnification. If I look through this viewfinder and I focus on, uh, on the subject, it's really magnified compared to what I'm seeing through the viewfinder. The rangefinder is quite magnified. On this camera, once again, it's all in the same window, but it's much more difficult to be critical in terms of focus. And this is especially true in low light. You know, this, these viewfinders on the Voigtlanders are not the biggest, brightest things ever. And when the light level gets lower, it gets more difficult to focus. So if I had to make a decision between a 1953-1954 BESA and an original BESA RF and 36, I'd buy the original BESA RF and 36 any day of the week just because of the dual window. Throw in the fact that it has an uncoated piece of glass, and in my case, it has this beautiful flip uh, yellow filter that's still intact. It's hard to believe after all those years. This to me is the camera of choice between the two any day of the week. Now let's go back, and once again, that's something that the Velta does not have. It does not have a magnified viewfinder. It's great in a lot of light, but when the light gets lower, it's just a little more difficult. Let's talk quickly about the two Zeiss cameras in front of me. These are both uh, Zeiss Super Iconta. Um, this is from uh, 1935. This is 1936. Oops, sorry, wrong camera. There we go. This is a 1935, 1936. Zeiss built some of the best cameras during this time period. They are just super, super, super solid. Zeiss decided they want to go with the Tessar design lens 
for a very specific reason. Because it only has a minimum number of elements, and the fact that they did a front cell focus, I think you can see how the front cell there is spinning and increasing, they were able to keep the camera smaller. Zeiss had the feeling that the number one issue with these cameras was going to be the rigidity. Lens plane to film plane. And so if you look at how the Zeiss is built, it's crazy. I mean, it's so solid. Holding the Zeiss camera is just a real joy in the hand. It's just so, so, so well built. And additionally, whereas the Voigtlander uses mirrors on the inside for their rangefinder, which is fine, that's what Leica used as well, Zeiss being Zeiss actually uses prisms. And as a result, the focus accuracy is just crazy good. The Voigtlanders, if they get banged around a lot, uh, can lose their uh, rangefinder accuracy. It's not a big deal. You can recalibrate it yourself pretty easily. Um, the Zeisses, once they're calibrated, they're pretty solid. There's not a lot to go wrong. The way you work with the Zeiss camera, this particular model here is from uh, 1935. I'll close it up and show you how it works. Cool thing about this one is it actually has the uh, maker's plate. I'm not sure if you can see that. The maker's plate right there of the, of the door, of the store, of the store who sold this camera in Kiel. It was called Photo Perrin, and this would have been in 1935, so their dealer plate is still on the camera. Um, the camera itself is a very simple button here on the top. You hold the camera at a slight angle like this. You don't want to let the camera just flop open. I have my hand here. I press it and I guide it down and then you flip up this rangefinder focusing wand here. You look through the window here on the back, there's a nice window, it has a magnification and here on the front there's a dial that you turn. So when I look through I get that classic rangefinder split image, I focus it until it's in focus and then I look through the window here on the top and take the photo. Really great. Interesting about this camera is in 1935 the release for this camera was here on the front of the lens. So it's a really simple mechanism. Let me just hold on here. You cock the shutter. I would look through the camera, focus it, and then put my hand right here, sort of stabilize the front of the camera, and squeeze off the shot. The advance is here on the bottom simply by turning this dial, and there are two windows. Great, super easy, super smooth. You know, there's no linkages to go bad. You're just advancing it till you see the number. That's great. Now, if I compare this camera from 35 to the same camera that came out in 36, there's quite a few differences. First off, the two windows on the back have a shade that slides to protect light from uh, getting into the back of the camera. Um, you know, this is important. I don't think it's that important, but if I was out photographing on a really bright sunny day on a beach, I always close those two windows between the shots just so stray light isn't getting into the camera. Additionally, they moved the shutter release from the front of the camera to the top of the camera. I'm torn as to which one I like. When I'm up here, I've got to focus and then move my hand and then shoot. So that's a longer action. Whereas on this camera, I'm focusing and then I just put my hand down and shoot. This is probably nicer, but I wouldn't say no to the 35 version either. So there are uh, at least four different versions of the Zeiss Super Iconta. There's A, B, C, and D. Um, D is this camera down here. Uh, it's a really big camera. This camera shot six, uh, 16 film, so it does not shoot 120. However, I had mine modified to use 120 film. So this becomes more of a panoramic negative. I'll do a post on this camera specifically later. Um, but you know, anything in the Zeiss range from you know, 35 on through say 38 is, is pretty much a solid bet. The biggest question you have to ask yourself is, is it important for me to be able to focus close up? If you wanna focus close up, find yourself a VESA RF, because this will focus down to a meter. Find yourself a VELTA in 6.9, and I think you'll be really happy. If that doesn't matter as much to you, you're doing landscape, you're doing general photography, any one of these cameras is the first choice. But once again, I cannot reiterate this enough. Make sure you find a good service technician to go over the camera before you use it. So in the coming weeks, I'll do additional uh, videos here on like cameras like the Character Super Sport Dollies, on different Voigtlanders, 
and, and what I like about those cameras. And if you have any questions about working with these cameras, please put it in the comments. Thank you very much for listening and have a great day.